Shalom, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night. It's good to be again with you. It's uh, kind of look forward to it each week now. Uh, this week, we're going to be working on the life of Sarah and not the death of Sarah. And I want to stress that all the way through because uh, right now, uh, one of my friends, his wife just passed away this week and it brought a lot of things back to my memory and uh, for my own family, but also to uh, think about as I'm going through this lesson. Um, why don't you turn over to uh, Genesis chapter 13? Let's look at the first couple of verses first and uh, get a new understanding, hopefully. It begins, Sarah's lifetime was 100 year. Now, my Bible says years, but that is not the word. The word is Shana, which is year. So the, Sarah's lifetime was 100 year, 20 year, and seven years. The years of Sarah's life. So we have a breakdown of her life. And notice it does not speak to her death. It only speaks to her life. That's the key that I want you to, to hang on to. That's where I want you to start. Because Sarah's lifetime and then Sarah's life. So we're going to be talking about Sarah while she was here and Sarah through the tunnel into the world to come. That's what we're going to talk about. When we think of life and death anymore, if we use the standard model, we have to understand we die to move on into another world. But we have to understand death is a very small part because death only simply means it's a beginning of a transition. So we will move from one world to the other. That's what's actually going to go on. Now, Sarah was, there was something very specific about hers in the fact that they broke down the number of years. The first number they gave you was 100. The second number they gave you was 20. And then finally, they gave you seven. Totally, she was, she was here for 127 years. But then they began to look at that whole thing and they began to ask themselves the question, why is it broken down this way? Why, why, and why is it only 100 year and 20 year? Why isn't it years? And so they began to, to look at the, the values of the numbers. And the values become very, very significant if you're thinking in mystical terms. First off, 100 is a perfect number. It's 10 times 10. 10 in Hebrew is the understanding of uh, the sephirot, the, the, the human being. So she was a perfect human being as they would go about looking at her. When they talk about 20, they're now talking about something else. I got to go back a second. The number 100 equals 10 times 10, which is the 10 sephirot. And each sephirot within it, in the first three sephirots, have all ten within it. In other words, it's a complete collection. And so Sarah was complete. Now with 20, we're talking about the brain. We're talking about the right side and the left side. Each one has ten sephirot. So therefore, we're looking at a mental image. Sarah mentally was extremely talented. In fact, we understand that Sarah was the most gifted of the prophetesses. She held the most significance of all of them. In fact, Abraham was told by God to listen to Sarah. So she held a great deal of understanding and wisdom that the others did not have. Now, the final seven is the seven sephirot that are left. That's, that's our emotions and that's our, our behaviors. That's what's dealing with those things. And when we go through the counting of the Omer, one goes through this idea of our emotions and our behaviors. The counting is about changing ourselves 
changing our emotions, changing our behaviors, moving towards God rather than away from God. So when he begins by explaining these three substances, he's really talking about her whole being. And that's why it ends with the fact of Sarah's life. Sarah's life was always about completeness. Now, there, Rashi talks about it in, in, in quite a different set of terms. When Rashi speaks about it, he's talking about the fact that at 100, she was as beautiful as she was at 20. And at 20, she was as innocent as she was at seven. So the concept is, is that she's constantly flowing. Yes, she's growing. Now, remember, when she goes down to Egypt, she's 90 plus. She's not quite what she's 80 years old going down there. And yet she is so attractive that the that Pharaoh chooses her to be in his harem. And not only that, she becomes his favorite in a short period of time. Now, later on, they come back to Israel. And what happens when they meet Abimelech? At that same point in time, she becomes part of his group. Again, Abraham, when they went down, knew that Sarah was beautiful. Sarah never saw her beauty, not her physical attractiveness. She was very, very modest in the way she lived, according to the Midrashic writings. So in that whole process, in that whole time, we have to understand that when he's talking about Sarah, he's talking about a person who, if you were trying to find the most perfect woman, she would have been it. In fact, Solomon, when he's creating his last book or last chapter in Proverbs, the valiant woman describes Sarah. That's his model. So we have a picture of her. And as in our, in our picture, death is never mentioned. And the reason it's never mentioned is because she moves from life to life. Now, look at the second verse for a second. Now, here it says Sarah died in Kiryat Araba. Now, we don't normally think of Kiryat Araba because we know the place as Hebron. But in the days in which Sarah lived there, the place was called Kiryat Araba, and the place was called Mamre. Those were the two names that were associated with this. Now, Kiryat is, 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 speaks of a city. Arba speaks of four. So it's a city of four. And as the Jewish people understand, what they're talking about is the four compartments in which the patriarchs will be placed and so that's what they're really talking about it so he goes there to Hebron. first he calls it Kiryat Araba which is Hebron. now remember who's writing this is Moses Moses is updating the name the name Hebron becomes such when the Canaanites the tribe from Ham will overtake the land of Israel. Up until then, remember, it belonged to Shem's clans. And as they lose territory, the names were changed because of the, the, the change in language. So it begins at Kiryat Arba, and then it goes to Hebron. Mamre, we saw actually in the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis, when uh, Abraham was on the third day suffering from his circumcision when the three angels approached. That was memory. So as we're going through this whole process, we understand then we start at memory originally, then it's Kiryat Araba. And by the way, Kiryat Araba is still there. Kiryat Araba is the Jewish quarter in the city of Hebron. Remember, the Palestinians technically run the West Bank, and Hebron is in that West Bank. And so as we go through our story then, Kiryat Araba still exists. In fact, three days ago, I wrote the article down, and I think I saved it for those who collect it. Um, 
Where is it? Hmm. Oh, I can't find it. I'll. I'm sure I'll run across it as I go through. But anyway. Oh, here it is. The shooter entered Givat Havot, which is a Jewish neighborhood. So within the, the section that belongs to the Jewish people living in Havron, there is a section called Givat Havot. Now, the Jewish neighborhood in Havron is under constant guard by Israeli troops to avoid things like this. So he enters the area of Kiryat Arba, which is the Jewish quarter, carrying an M16 rifle. He's a 49-year-old Israeli man, Ron Hanani, was walking back to his car with his son, who was 19 years old, holding their grocery bags. And they had just gotten their gro from the local grocery store, which was close to the Ashmoret checkpoint. Ashmoret is the, is the checkpoint that's closest to um, Jerusalem. That's the northwest gate. So anyway, that's where they're at. Now, Hanas became began to unload the groceries. The gunman who was hiding to the left of their vehicle opened fire and fatally uh, shot Renaud in the head and his Daniel in the hand. Then the attack attacker flees. Well, Daniel waited for about 15 minutes for emergency services to come and then headed back to the store until the security forces arrived on the scene with the paramedics. He returned to the grocery store because he believed that the grocery store was under fire. And so that's where he was headed. Now, as he exited the store, the shooter reappears and begins shooting at the people outside the store. A Magan David Odom, which is a paramedic back there, was seriously injured along with the Palestinian bystander. The security guard rammed into the attacker with a car and the shooter was then killed by the off-duty officer. Now, the whole story goes back to the fact that the man who did this attack was actually a school teacher in Hebron. He was in the Palestinian section, and he was had ties, evidently, to Hamas. And remember, the word Hamas in Hebrew means violence. So our story goes on to talk about some of these things. I want you to look at the very first word on in Hebrew in our verse. It's a vav, a yud, a he, a yud, and a vav. That's the first word that's that's located there. Vahayiyu. Now, Vahayiyu is not significant, except it's, it's, it's a way of introducing something. And in this particular case, it's, it's introducing and was Sarah. Sarah being the second word. So it, in an introduction, then, we have this simple statement. But if you look at the simple statement, the first thing that you can do is you can count the value of the letters. And that's what I did. The first letter is a vav, which has a value of six. He has a value of 10. Or yud has a value of 10. He has a value of five. Yud has a value of 10. Vav, I get the end, has a value of six. Total, 37. Now, What's the function of this word? Again, commentators begin to look at the word and they begin to try to understand what, why is it here? What's its, what's its importance? If it's just there for and, that would be one thing. And and was doesn't make sense by itself. And so they counted the value and it was 37. Now, 37 doesn't mean much to us. But 37 is the actual age at which Isaac was to be sacrificed, offered on the altar. 37. Now, if we take a look at the 37, the question then becomes, why is 37 attached to the fact of Sarah's lifetime? Because it speaks to the fact that Sarah's life really began 37 years earlier with her first child. That was the beginning of Sarah. Now, she would have lived all those years, 90 years before that. But in her mind, those were the most important years. And remember Jacob, when he went down to Egypt and, and was reunited with his son. Those were the 17 happiest years of, of Jacob's life. So family was very important, which tells us something else about what happened. If we go 
down and continue the story. In verse 2, again, Sarah died at Kiryat Arba, which is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the land was now shifting from Seth's family to Ham's family. And Abraham came, notice the order. He came to eulogize Sarah and then to bewail her. Normally, when you get the news of a death, what's the first thing that you usually do? There's the wailing, the crying, the, the frustration, trying to put it all together. But he begins by thinking of the eulogy of her. He seemingly is holding it in. Some say he held it in because of the fact he knew where she was. He knew that she had already passed, that everything was all right. But then there's a problem. The problem is, is that Abraham had to be told that Sarah had passed on. Why did he have to be told? Well, in the previous chapter, when Abraham sacrificed or was to sacrifice Isaac, he left with his two servants and went to Beersheba. Now, Beersheba was down south. It was about a day and a half's walk between Beersheba and Hebron. Why didn't he go home? Why didn't he go to Beersheba? Why does he choose to go down? And again, there were lots of theories as what's going on. Some simply believed that he went to check on the place. He thought everything was fine at home. So he went down to check to make sure that his Eshel, his inn that he had established there years before, was okay. I found it fascinating when I was doing my research that Aiden Steinstaltz, the guy who created the latest version of the Talmud, believed that Abraham and Sarah were separated and that he went to the second dwelling. He went to the vacation home and not else. Now, he has a lot of reasons, and, and they do make sense. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm just here to let you know that there's something else in the story. More questions than answers, because our scriptures really don't fill in all the blanks. You have to go to Midrashic writings. And again, Midrash is stories, stories that help explain. And many stories do not agree with other stories. I, I come by that from... Uh, earlier, when I was teaching Noah, why did it take Noah so long to build the ark? Well, some stories hold that Noah built the ark by himself. Others say, no, he hired the local people, and that's how he tried to witness to them. There's another section which deals with the animals on the ark. Several of the stories say that Noah was responsible solely for feeding all the animals. Other story says, no, the feeding was done by the whole family. Again, stories are there to help fill in blanks, but they're not always accurate. But they give us a better sense of how the, the story plays out. Now, as we're looking at this particular story, then what we have to understand is that, that as we're going through, Sarah has, is perfect. And so in this perfection, something has happened where Abraham does not go home right away. That's the only thing we can come to understand for sure. Once he arrives, his first action is to eulogize her. His second action is to weep over her. But even in weeping, I want you to go again back to the story. And if you look at that second verse again, it says that Abraham came to eulogize her. And then the word my Bible uses is the word bewail. Well, the Hebrew doesn't match that. The Hebrew is to cry or to weep, a more subtle and a more silent tone. And if you were to go to look at, if you had an art scroll, and I'm sure whatever Bible you're using, if you go to the word for to cry or bewail, which is a vav, a lamed, a bet, a kof, a tav, and a hey, which is followed by a colon, meaning that's the end of the sentence, you'll see that the third, fourth letter, the kaf, which looks like a C that's backwards, 
is small. Mm -hmm. The understanding is the fact that it's small is because of his weeping was small, most negligible. You know, some people can go, go through a trial and weeping is not something that they do. They just simply go through the trial. Well, here he does weep so that people understand that he is mourning his wife, but it is not loud. It's not boisterous. It's not, he's not attempting to overshadow what's gone on. He just simply does. Now in the process of just simply does, we, we have to understand that, that there's this process that's actually going to go on. And it's the process of death and how we are to handle it. And some of what I have tonight came from Rabbi Sutton. When I was dealing with my dad's death, Rabbi Sutton is who I contacted to help explain to me the Jewish understanding of what was actually going on, what, what I should understand. And I've shared it with several people, and tonight I want to share it with all of you so that you get an understanding of the, of the philosophy of the Jew and how it is different than Christian, how some of the Christian things have been kind of missing. We don't recognize all that's going to go on. So I, I, I want to go back and, and do those kinds of things. Now, Rabbi Nachman, who is one of those men that I also like to read, when he was talking about memories and death and all of those other things, he says, we do not want to die in order to reach the world to come. God forbid. Instead, we must remember the world to come while we are living. And by doing so, we connect the world's and draw the life force of the world to come down into the life of this world. So if we remind ourselves that death is, is a transition, and during our, our time of thinking about this transition, we should also be thinking about the world to come. Not that we want to be there any sooner. What we want to do is draw down the forces of good into this world. That's what it's about. When we go to a, a, a funeral and there, people are asked to witness to, the, to this life that was just taken, what are they looking for? They're looking for the good things to draw down into this world, good memories, good ideas. Because you see, that is import, as important as honoring that person who passed. Because we want to fill our lives with good things. That's what we're trying to do. And so as we go through this whole thing, we have to understand that that's going to go on. Now, that is all that he says about this whole process of that. The next 18 verses deals with the purchase of the land. A rather short memorial. But it's also one other thing that we can understand. This is the first time the first time in which actually somebody's gravesite has been identified for us. Now, Sarah is the Kof, the 20th generation. 20 becomes a very interesting number as we go through this whole process. But as we think about it, then we're going to go from here and start looking at the process that Abraham is, goes through. And so I want you to look at verse number three. Abram rose up from the presence of his dead, from Sarah, and spoke to the children of Heth. Tells me another thing about what's going on there. They were there witnessing what's happening. This is the first congregational funeral that we read about. It was not... Moses going up on the mountain by himself. It was not, they simply passed. This one had a crowd, an audience, who came to eulogize what was going on. I want you to turn back to chapter, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter number seven. And I want you to look at the second verse. Somebody stole it from my Bible. 
I know I have it in here somewhere. Here it is. Chapter 7, verse number 2. Are you with me? It is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. In other words, if you had a chance to go to a funeral or to a wedding, which one should you choose? The answer is is according to Solomon for that is the end of all man and the living should take it to heart to go to a funeral first off is a mitzvah when we <clears throat> go to a funeral we go there to honor another person who cannot repay what we're about to do he simply or she simply has passed on we are there to honor them. And at the same time as we're sitting there, oftentimes what happens to us, we begin to reflect on what's going on and what's happened. And we sometimes will even choose to make our lives better. We will say we will do this. We affirm what's actually happening. Now at a funeral, at a, at a wedding, you, you memorialize them, yes, but it, you're joyous for them. It really is a separate idea. But Solomon saw it better that we actually memorialize those who have passed on. Now, I want you to, again, look at the next verse, verse 4. Having all of the people around him, having watched, he now gets up, and he, having eulogized his wife, he now looks around the crowd. He still doesn't own a place to put her body. Because it says, I am an alien and a resident among you. Grant me an estate for the burial site with you, that I may bury my dead from before me. Now the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God in our midst. In the choicest of our burial places, bury your dead. Any of us will not withhold his burial place from you for or from burying you are dead now it, it is understanding in israel today that if uh, a gentile dies he is not allowed to be buried in a jewish cemetery nor is he allowed to be buried in a palestinian cemetery there's a their own special plots but notice here they're willing to give him a choice plot in their cemetery. That is how much honor she and he have earned in the time that they've been in this place. And notice how they ref refer to him at this point. He tells them he's an alien, but they say, you are a prince of God. So in other words, he has made a huge inroad into those people. They now understand who God is. And that he is his second in command. He's his ambassador to them. So it goes on to say, and the children of Heth answered and said those things. Look at verse 7. Then Abraham rose up, bowed down to the members of the council, to the children of Heth. He spoke to them, saying, if it is truly your will to bury my dead from before me, heed me and intercede for me with Ephron the son of Zohar, the son of brilliance, Ephron, I, I want his property. I want to be buried on his land, not in a cemetery, but on his land. Now let him grant me the, the cave of Machpelah, which in his, on the edge of, the, of his field, let him grant it to me for its full price, in your midst as an estate for my burial site. So he does not want to be given a place. He is willing to pay full price. That's the important understanding. He wants and is willing to pay the full price. Now, Ephron was sitting in the midst of the children of Het, and Ephron, the Hittite, responded to Abraham in the hearing of the children of Het for all uh, who come to the gate of this city, saying, no, my Lord. Well, it's, I missed a line, didn't I? Responded to Abraham in the hearing of this whole thing. No, my Lord, heed me. I have given you the field. 
He doesn't want to be given the field. And it is very significant, very, very significant that he pay for this field, not to be given it. When this is all said and done, Abraham will have bought a piece of the rock. In other words, it's uncontestable, even by the Arabs, that Abraham owns a piece which is called Machpelah. The problem is the Arabs, as well as the Jews, both believe that Abraham is their father. And therefore, they both hold claim to that spot of ground. But we have to understand the Jews will have that first piece of land. Second piece of land that they will purchase in the land of Israel will be the land that, that Jacob buys just outside the city of Shechem from the king of Shechem, Hamor. And that will be the second piece of property. Now that property will eventually will be given to Joseph as an inheritance. Now there's a third piece of property that's purchased and that was by King David. And he purchased the property called Mount Moriah or Mount Zion. He purchased the Temple Mount. So three land purchases, deeds created, indicates that the Jews actually do own part of the land and should not be kicked out. And now in 67, they earned the portion of land that David had purchased. They're still living in a quarter of Hebron. And at the same point in time, Shechem, which is Nabalus, which is the city in which Joseph's tomb is found, that also belongs to the Palestinians. So they only actually have one piece of property, and that's even contested. But they purchased three at this point in time. So they have lay a perfect claim to the land. And that's why Abraham wanted to make sure that he paid for it. And he didn't want a discount price. He wanted to pay full price. Now, there's no mention as to what full price was going to look like. But I went to a, a, another rabbi called Rabbi Miller, Moshe Miller, in which he began to talk about this and he he began to deal with this whole process of laying it out. He read, and it's, it comes from the Zohar, and, and I need to preface this now. There are many, many versions of the Zohar. There's a standard version that most people have. There's another version called the Tikkune, and there's another version that, that that's, um, I can't even think what it's called now, um, three that I know of, but there's probably more than that. Now, this is from Rabbi Moshe's understanding, and I'm going to read it because I don't want to make the mistake. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, also known as Rashbi, said, come and see the mystical explanation of these words. Why does the verse use the word year in the singular form after 100 and again after 20, but Shni, years, in the plural for seven? And then he begins to list out the same things I've talked to you about. Now, as we go through this whole understanding, there's, there's a, another important thing to, to know. The Torah recounts Ephraim, Manash, or Abraham's sale in great detail, including the price purchase of 400 kesef, 400 silver shekels. Now, shekels were a standard of money. But silver shekels, again, shekels is the idea of, of a weight. So a shekel has a weight. When you go and purchase silver coins these days, they tell you the weight of the coin in terms of the amount of silver that's in it. Well, Abraham was so wealthy that he actually created his own currency. He created his own shekel based on weight. And so he paid 400 silver shekels to Ephron. Oh, by the way, the name Ephron has a numeric value of 400. So we don't know how 
uh, Frone created the number, but it matches his own name. So they begin to understand that maybe there was a little greed when he decided to ask for full price. But whatever it was, he still paid for it. Now, based on the figure, the 13th century Rabbi Yitzhak Bar Yehuda makes makes uh, provides us with an interesting cal calculation from a, a Le Leviticus 27, 16, the value of the land in biblical times was 50 silver shekels for a area about the size of 75,000 cubits. And a cubit is the width of a man. So he's buying space for 75,000 men to stand. But actually he didn't buy that much, he bought more. He bought enough land for 600,000 men to stand upon. That was the size of the land that, that of that field that he actually purchased was the width of 600,000 men. So it becomes very, very significant. Now 400 is also another significant number. Over and over again, the number 400 is used in the Bible. Begin with, let's go back to the story of um, Jacob meeting Esau for the first time after uh, spending 20 cough years with Laban. When he comes back to this point, we have to understand that Esau is playing the role of king. In fact, some people say he's the reincarnation of Cain. Remember, Cain kills Abel, brothers. Cain being the older kills the younger. Jacob is the younger brother. So in the course of our study, or in the course of what we're talking about, Jacob has left Laban's house after 20 years, and he's now moving back. And he sends messengers to, to Esau, letting him know he's coming into the land. Well, as he sends the messengers, the messengers come back saying, Esau is coming, but he's bringing 400 warriors with him. 400. Interesting number. Now, when it's all said and done, the question then becomes, well, who are the 400? Again, if you were talking in a mystical language, you'd say the 400 were actually 400 sparks from years ago, 400 souls that have now since passed away and are still needing to reach fullness. When it's all said and done, Esau is standing there with Jacob talking, but we never hear again of the 400 soldiers. That's because the 400 left. And according to the text, they left whole, meaning that they had now changed. They had what we call sparks. God has us out looking for sparks, changing lives, digging from the earth, bringing out the nutrients of the earth, sparks. In this process, then, we're talking about something that is far more mystical. But the idea is Cain meets Abel, and they now come to an agreement. Instead of a rock on the head, there's a hug and a crying, a tears on the shoulders. 400 is also the, last, the value of the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Tav. So it speaks to the end of what's going on. Now, I keep using the word 20. One of the things that I understand about 20 is that if you multiply 20 times 20, you get 400. And so there seems to be a relationship between 20 and 400. And it, the cough, I, I don't know how many of you are that familiar with your alphabet, but if you were to take and put your alphabet on a line, the 11th letter in the alphabet is a cough. The 22nd letter in the alphabet is a tav. Now, normally, they split the alphabet, the first 11 on the first line, the second 11 on the second line. They're opposite one another. There's a companionship between the two numbers. And there's a lot of writing. Uh, Rabbi Ginsberg has a book dealing with the, the Hebrew alphabet and the numeric value. And so he begins to talk about the fact that this is about the that the 20 that we're talking about, the 20 years that Jacob spent in uh, Laban's house, 20 squared, 20 times 20, 
refers to the, the squaring refers to Rachel and Leah, each one equaling 20. And so he spends 20 years serving for the two women that he comes up with. Let's go on. So in verse number nine, he says, let him, let him grant me the cave of Mechpelah, which is on the edge of the fields. And he goes through the whole idea of what's there. Now, Kiryat Arba, remember, is the city of four. Machpelah was the, not the field, but was the cave. That was the significance. And the significance of Machpelah is the significance of four holes, four caves, actually two caves, one above and one below. The one above will be where Abraham, Sarah, and the first people that were found in that cave, and that's Adam and Hava. If we go back to this story, Genesis chapter 18, Abraham has spent, what, three days suffering through circumcision. Now, this is the hottest day of the year, and all of a sudden, three men approach him. Now, he doesn't recognize who the three men are, but he assumes that they're, they are men. And so he has the tent of hospitality because he doesn't close any walls on his tent. And at the same point in time, he doesn't close the walls. He tells Sarah, I want you to begin to bake bread and all of the foods necessary, and I'll go get the calves. And he decided he needed three calves in order to satisfy the meal that day. Well, in going out to the, to the field, two of them came easily, but the third one ran off. Now, remember, Abraham's tent is at Mamre. It's right there near the cave of Machpelah. And the calf runs into the cave. And that for the first time, Abraham sees two people laying there with candlelight around them. And that was Abraham, or that was Adam and Hava. And so he talks with them for a while. And there's a whole lot of stories that go with that. But I just... We're running out of time, so I'm going to keep going. So in the sense of the story, this is the cave that he now decides is where he wants to bury his wife. And so that is why he begs Ephron for that particular spot. And that's why he wants to pay full price. Later, it will also be occupied by his son, Isaac, and his wife, Rebecca. And it will also be occupied by his grandson, Jacob, and his second wife, or actually his first wife, Leah. And so all eight will be found in that cave. Now, there's been a couple of stories of people trying to get into that cave underneath the Mount Palaz monument to look at the bodies in there to find out if who is really buried in Grant's tomb, who is really buried there. Now, so far, they've been foiled. But the question is, how will they know whose body is there? One body will be very different from the other seven. That body will be Joseph, or not Joseph, will be Jacob. Because you remember in chapter 50 of Genesis, he was embalmed. He was not treated in the way that the others were. And so therefore, therefore when you find his body, you will find a petrified body, as opposed to one that has turned to dust and ashes. So that's what's going on. But they're not able to get into the cave. And the Jews are not pressing for that either. Well, anyway, let's go on. So in verse number, let's pick it up in 11. No, my Lord, heed me. I have given you the field as it is. And he says, I've given you the field. Continue on by verse 13. He spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the members of the council, saying, Rather, if only you would heed me, give me the price of the field, accept it from me, and that I may bury my dead there. Again, he continues to call her dead there. But if we start over again at the beginning, it's about her life, not about her death. When Abraham buys this property, he understands he is buying a portal from one world to the other, from this world to the world to come. 
that was what he was buying at this particular point in time. Now, this weekend will be very significant because this weekend is the weekend when a lot of armored buses will be going over to Havron because this is the weekend that they honor Sarah. And so there will be a memorial over there. And so in order to get in, you have to come in an armored transport. Armored covered school buses to get you into the city. It's not very pleasant there. And there'll be a large military guard to make sure that everything goes well. So anyway, by verse number 17, and Ephraim's field, which was in Machpelah facing Mamre, or Mamre was where he was at, the field and the cave within it, and all the trees in the field with all its surrounding boundaries was confirmed. As Abraham or as Abraham, as a purchase of the view of the children of Het among all who came to the city gate. And afterwards, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, facing Mamre, which is Hebron, and in the land of Canaan. And thus the field with which, field with the cave that was in it, was confirmed as Abraham's as an estate, an estate and a burial site at that point in time from the children of Het. So it's been attested that Abraham owns this particular field. It's quarter of, I don't want to go any farther. Anybody have any thoughts, questions, things that you've learned? Oh, wait a second, I do have something else. I want to give you Rabbi Sutton's advice to me and understanding. Rabbi Sutton wrote to me and in his writing, he makes these several points. Among the values of things that he wants, that he shared, I wanted to, to pass on one, a true Jew mourns the deceased while continuing to affirm the continuing course of their own life. Because your spouse passes away does not mean that that's the end for you. Two, the Jewish funeral follows the normal Kaddush, and you can, find, you can look that up and, and see how that process of mourning works. Three, show profound respect for the body. Four, they understand its necessity and understand how the body enables the soul to accomplish actions and the goals during its person's life. Five, they should never allow themselves to imagine that the body is actually the person that they're mourning. We do not mourn the body. We mourn the soul. Now he goes on and gives us some more details. He says, as, as you're going through this, giving charity in the name of that person is a good deed. That's a mitzvah. Studying the Torah in the name of that individual is a good deed. Recite the half Torah in the merit of, this, of the one who has just passed on. <clears throat> Sharing with the community a portion of the mis Mishnah, the letters that can be arranged to show the word neshama is always important. I also want to suggest to you when you're going through this, it is understood that if you go to chapter 119 in the book of Psalms, if you know the, the name of your person in Hebrew, you may go to the, those eight stanzas for each letter. And as you go through them, you will find your missing person. Next, it says, <clears throat> light a candle during the Sheva, during the memorial time. And also, again, on the anniversary of their passing. Build a mausoleum or a house to place this body in. Placing a headstone over the gravesite to create a seat for that uh, mafkim, the, the transcendent soul of the body is important. And finally, for those who don't attend a funeral but want to show their, uh, their uh, grief, and they may even attend the funeral, they may choose to place a stone upon the headstone to show respect regarding the individual. I don't know how many of you ever watched Schindler's List and at the end of Schindler's List there at the cemetery outside of Jerusalem and you look at the stones and you find the headstones and you will find little stones on top of it. That's to mark it. 
Now the the concept comes from the word for word for stone in Hebrew, which is Even. Now Even is actually can actually be an acronym. So we have the letters Aleph, Bet, and then the final one is Nun. So you can actually say that it could be an Ava or Abba Ben Neked, Father, Son, Grandson. Or you can, or grandfather, I should say. And the other one is that for, if it's a female, you have Ima Bat Nevadat, which is a mother, daughter, and a grandmother. So the stone itself is just a marker to show your relationship with the person and to show respect and honor. I'm finding more and more often different shows that we're watching on TV, stones on top of, of headstones, which does nothing more than reminds me of, of the story of Sarah. But I thought I'd want to share that with you. And with the time left, if you have any questions, why don't you start firing away? Or if you have a thought, I appreciate thoughts too. So go for it. 